Welcome to another parent workshop. We are here in my school room. Welcome to my school room. Um, but you're not going to be looking at this long because we're here to learn from Lori. She's going to teach us about writing a story with our kids. So I'm just going to hand it to Lori. You guys already know her and love her like I do. But take the stage. It's yours, Lori. Hi, everybody. I'm so happy that you're here. <laughs> I see at least, at least one familiar face. Hi, Tanya. It's nice to have you join us. Um, and everybody else that's so, thank you for being here, for taking time out of your Friday evening. I know it's a major commitment and, and I appreciate it. It's so much easier to teach to faces than to just a blank screen, <laughs> so I, I appreciate that. Okay, I have a lot of um, really awesome things to share with you tonight and I'm very excited about it. Um, I wanna just preface this by letting you know that I'm gonna have to do a lot of screen swapping. I've become a little bit more tech savvy since my last one of these. So instead of holding things up to the screen, I'm gonna like have them on the screen for you, but you just need to bear with me as I swap back and forth. So I'm going to start by um, showing you the end result. So we're gonna start at the end and then we're gonna work towards the end, okay? So this is, <clears throat> the goal of this workshop is to get give you all of the tools and a bunch of really creative ideas so that you can then, whenever you're ready to do it, you can just get it going. And I'm using the step up to writing curriculum like I've, I've talked about in the past and I have done other writing videos using the step up to writing. That's the curriculum I'm using here as well, but I'm pulling in some other resources um, to supplement with that. And so that's what you'll be printing off though, would be the step up to writing curriculum, which I love, I think it's fantastic. And I especially love their narrative writing unit. So that's what you guys have available to you. So I wanna tell you really quick about that. Um, you probably saw on the email that you, you saw a two to five, two dash five step up and then six dash 12 step up. The, the two dash five, yes, that's technically from the younger grade um, curriculum. But the six to 12, it's, it's so appropriate for, it doesn't really matter, okay? So it's a lot of it's gonna be so very similar. So I would recommend printing off the six to 12. And Katrina, you mentioned that you're going to have these available at the office as well, right? Yes, I'm gonna print a bunch of them. And so if you don't have access to a printer or you just, I don't know, if you just wanna stop by the office, they will be just sitting by the front so just ask Michaela for a packet, it'll be waiting for you. Yep, because this is a hefty packet. So um, we wanted to just make this available to you in case you, you would like it. So here we go. So I'm going to first hold this up, even though I said I wasn't. This is starting with the end and then I'll go in a little bit closer. So you're going to be making a book with your child or with your children that you're going to publish. You're gonna take it to the final draft stage. This is an example of a book that my son uh, made when he was 10 um, and so, I'm just gonna show you a couple of things really quick and then I'm gonna open up the, the full screen just to give you a quick sense of this, okay? Let's see here. This is where I need you to just be bear with me. Share screen. And, no, that's not the one. Oh, sorry guys, give me just a second here, okay. Uh-oh, Katrina, I'm not able to get, I've got a PDF open, a PDF window, and it's not sharing for me. Are you sure, am I definitely a co-host? You are definitely a co-host. I will try one more time though, just to make sure. Okay, so that PDF, and let me try this one more time. There we go, oh, thank goodness. Okay, sorry about that, you guys. All right, so. Here we have, um, it's, he titled it Obi-Wan Kenobi and Anakin in Star Wars Search for the Holocrons. So uh, what you can see right off the bat is that um, this is something that he created his cover, however he, you know, he wanted to do it with um, Microsoft Word and Word Art. Um, and that was printed off on like heavy duty paper. And then we have written and illustrated by his name. And then if we go down here, when you first open up a book, as you know, there's the title page. So I taught him about title pages and he wrote his little title page. And then I just, I, I didn't copy his entire thing, but I just wanna show you a couple of aspects of this. Number one, um, it's going to be important when you're thinking about the subject of your child's story to, 
to tap into what they're into. So my son for, uh, you know, he's a teenager now, but for most of his childhood was completely obsessed with Legos and Star Wars as well. So it made perfect sense to him that his story was going to be totally related. It was going to be Star Wars and that instead of drawing his, his illustrations, he was going to actually use his toys to create the scenes. So that's what you can see here. You can see that he created scenes. And I wanna point a couple of things out. We have a blend of artwork and toys going on. So this would be black paper that he painted white spots on to have the galaxy. This would be like a little earth thing that he kind of laid there to show like a, a, like a planet was hanging. And then he just laid this piece on here. And then he had me be his photographer. So I took pictures with my iPhone. And then, so he, I, was, I was the photographer and he set the, the stage and he, he wrote the story first. So now remember this, we're at the end and I'm gonna take you guys through all the steps, okay? This is just one idea. He wrote the story first and then he had to create the scenes to match the text. So a couple of things I would like to point out to you is that the pictures, the scenes that are happening here match the words, the text of the story, and that, that I was really insistent that he show action as much as possible. So you can also see that the, the characters are engaging with each other. And here in the background, we have another painting because he needed it to look like there was fire happening. And he was very particular. And um, so as I just scroll through, that, that's what I want you to pay attention to is just the props. Okay, we even we pulled a rock out of the hermit, hermit crab cage here because it looked like it was, should be on planet. You know, like he, he was very creative in how he pulled it in. And then I, another thing I wanna point out, and this will be the last thing I point out to you, is that um, the, the language. So in your story, in their story, they'll be using dialogue. They're going to be having, um, well, depending on what point of view they write the story and they're going to be having the characters talk to each other. And when they're talking to each other, we develop the story, we develop the plot line, we develop the conflicts, which are the problems, through the, the way that they talk. And so if you just look at this very first sentence, you have to go through me, jeered Palpatine. I mean, that's a very like heavy word, right? So, so this did not come out immediately of a 10 year old's mind, right? So this is all of these little things that you see on here are the result of multiple mini lessons. So we started at the beginning and then just worked our way through. The last thing that I wanna show you before I click out of this is the text is typed and glue sticked onto the page. The pictures were taken with my camera and then I emailed them down to the UPS store and they printed them off on heavy duty paper for me. Very cheap and very easy. And then we glue stick them in. So easy peasy. All right, so I'm going to now stop share here. Okay, am I back Katrina correctly? Tell me if at any point I, I'm not back correctly. Okay, so now that leads me to my next thing, which is that I, I, was, I so desperately want everybody who's excited about this and who wants to take this idea to the final draft stage, I wanted you to have the book to do this with. And when I bought this, I bought a pack of them like at Target. Target doesn't have them anymore. So I asked our principal if she would buy a bunch for our families and she did. So this, this is actually bigger than the ones that I had. This is really, it's, it's a little bit bigger. And um, there are a bunch of these at the front desk at our family partnership office. So for those of you who watch this, who participate in this parent workshop or who watch this video, this parent workshop at any point, and you say, yes, I want to do that. Stop by the office and grab one of these, okay? get one per child. So you have now the ability to do this. And I just wanna show you, um, the paper on this is actually a little bit nicer, but it's just totally blank with a nice heavy duty cardboard. Okay, I am now ready to move forward to the next step. Okay, now I'm gonna share screen again. Let me close out of this. Let's see if I can do this faster now. Okay, I am opening up this. Okay, let's see if you guys have this. Share screen. There it is. Okay. So, have, has everybody printed this off? You can just nod if you have it. Okay. 
So I made this template for you. Some of the things that I have put in this packet of things you printed off, I made. Just I'm just kind of thinking ahead of like what could make things easier for you and um, what could cause frustration. And then I tried to avoid that for you. So um, I, one of the things that I think would have been easier for me in this process, and granted this was like five years ago when I did this book with my son, um, I, I think that what, it, what would have been easier for us is if we had the template. So what, I, what I'm going to want you to do with this, and it, it says on um, the next paper that printed off with this, looks like this, and now I need to share. <laughs> this is what one thing I don't love about Zoom is that you have to keep toggling back and forth. Okay, now you guys can see this one. Okay, so this should have printed off with the template. So first thing up on the left, it says print off 14 of the template page so that you will have exactly enough for the number of pages in the book. So there are 28 pages in this book, okay? This is not because you're going to put your final draft on the template paper, cut it out and glue stick it into the book. No, this is so that you have enough to plan, fully plan the whole storyline out. I come up with your ideas for the illustrations and make sure that the whole story fits and make your adjustments. So, that, so the template is your rough draft. So print all 14 off and then that gives you all 28 pages right at the beginning. Okay, I highly recommend that um, you either three hole punch them and keep them in a binder so that you keep them all together like paper clipped together or staple them. If you keep them paper clipped together or in a three ring binder, it might be better. And here's why, because then you can lay them out like on the dining table or down the hallway or on the living room floor. When you're in the, you're actively, um, working with your child on coming up with the different steps of their story so that they can visually see, oh, wait, if I, if I have all these things happen and I'm already at the end of my 28 pages, wait a minute, I'm not going to get to the end, to the point I'm trying to make. And so then they can see visually that they have to pull some things out and make some adjustments. So it really does help with the pacing. Um, Again, uh, but if you staple it, that's that's great too. But they're just going to have to visual, you know, remember that when they're opening it, they're going to come to the end. So sometimes lining it out works well. Um, just depends on your child. You will want to number the pages. That little box right there. That I do. I, I actually specifically remember being a problem for us, trying to remember because it wasn't my story, so I wasn't totally sure which page went where. Right. And so when I was trying to help my son, that, that did lead to some frustration. I remember if we had numbered the pages on the rough drafts, that would have been really nice for me. So I put that little box there for you guys. Okay. Now, one of the things, the very first thing that you're going to do, and I'll be modeling it for you, um, is you're going to use children's books to teach your child how to write their own story. Um, and so a lot of this workshop is going to take you through the process of that. So that's why at this, that this very top box that I said, when you're looking at children's book examples together, that's because you will be doing that. So here's what you want to do. You want to discuss how the text and the artwork can be done in any way. There's so many awesome ideas. They can have artwork covering both sides. Like you open the book and the, the same picture can cover both sides and just be cut and glue sticked on. They could have um, words only on one side. They could have words all over it. They could, you know, wherever they want them to be. And so you want to show them a wide range of um, different types of illustrations. And I'll show you some examples here in a minute. Okay. Um, ideas for illustrations. So the very hungry caterpillar, right? So I'm going to show you this one really. Oh, this is not going to be easy. Sorry, guys. Let me just do another. Um, oh, hmm. So this is where my problem is, Katrina. My computer doesn't show me where the Zoom stop share is. Maybe it's hiding below something. There it is. I'm hiding. Stop share there and then open up this. Okay. There we go. Okay, so the very hungry caterpillar. This is like a favorite child, you know, children's 
story, Eric Carle, if you don't have The Very Hungry Caterpillar, you more, more than likely have another one of his books in your home. How did Eric Carle create his illustrations? Well, he did watercolors and then he cut them. He cut the pieces and he just put things together. Very, very creative. Okay, stop share. We'll go back to here. Okay. Okay, back to here. Um, another one, watercoloring as your background and then drawing the pictures into the watercolor painting. So that background piece is really important. And remember in Cole's story, he, he did paintings as his backdrop and then he set his toys up in front of it so that he had, you know, he had that backdrop. If he had just set his toys on the dining room table or on the floor and we took pictures, the backdrop would be the background of the table or the floor and it wouldn't have been um, as exciting for him um, because, I, I, let me back up here. Having that backdrop, it pulls the whole scene together. So, so we want to, when we're showing them examples of stories, we want to talk about what's happening in the background, what's happening in the foreground. What did the um, illustrator do to create this? Um, okay, another one, set up scenes with their toys and then you be the photographer. Now we talked about that. You can easily send those pictures to the UPS store and not use your own colored ink. They will print them off for you with very high quality ink um, on heavy duty paper. I will tell you though, we will not be able to reimburse for anything printed at the UPS store. So that's just one of the, I just wanna make sure that you guys are aware of that. We can, we can reimburse you for ink that you buy for your home um, under tech, not under tech supplies, under um, general supplies, but we cannot reimburse for if you send it somewhere to be printed. Um, and then another idea is black and white or shades of gray with one color, like Olivia, the pig character. So um, has anybody here seen, read any Olivia books? Let's see, I'm gonna open up to my stop share and share Miss Olivia, like one of my faves. Okay, so you know what's so creative about the Olivia um, stories, if you guys have seen her, her, the stories are all black and white, shades of gray, but the author has chosen just one aspect in his story, one aspect is going to get color and it's the same color. And so it's a really creative part of this. So that's another, another thing to discuss with them about you know, the options that they have. Really, anything goes. Um, let's see here. Okay, let me go back to this. Share. Okay, um, the next thing. So the template is your rough draft, okay? Because it's a rough draft and we want all of their energy and hard work to go into the final draft, don't have them put very much into the template for illustrations. In the template, the illustrations should just be either a quick sketch of what their scene is going to be, or some words saying this picture will be blah, blah, blah. This is going to be my dinosaurs fighting and uh, the pterodactyl is uh, tearing apart the brontosaurus, okay? Something like that. So they, on the template, they're just either quickly sketching what's gonna happen in the scene or they are writing what's gonna happen in the scene but, but be very careful that they are clear that, and you are clear that if they're writing what's going to happen in the scene, they don't then mistake that for the text of the story. So what I would do if they're going to write what the scene will look like, I would probably circle that. So we know that's just an idea of what, um, how we're gonna set this up. And then the text for the story, this is where you really want to have the templates because when they write their story, they're not going to be writing it on these pages. They're gonna write it on paper. Excuse me, um, let me see where I have that written up. Okay, that's the next section right here. Since the book is going to be taken to the publishing stage, it would be a very good idea for the text to be typed, and then you can just cut it out and glue stick the typed text to the pages of the book. Have your child handwrite the text on the template pages, or if they're going to write the story out on a few sheets of paper, then you just cut the writing out where it makes the most sense for the scene, and then you glue stick that to the template. Make, you can make it so easy, literally, like if, they are, if they have their story written out on notebook paper, 
you just together you say where would it make the most sense for the action to change or the scene to change here should where should we start a fresh page and they say oh it would make sense right here they know they know what they want going on in their story just draw a line right there and as you're going through their writing draw lines and then that's where you cut and then just tape or glue stick though their words right onto the template and that's going to help you line out the story okay um all right, so back to the action. So the very bottom part of this, it's very important that when you're looking at, at um, stories together, that um, each illustration on each page or most of the pages in any book, there is action happening. That's what keeps us engaged in a story that we're reading. The, the illustration keeps us hooked in. Um, you wanna point out the expressions on the characters' faces. And as you read, ask them what they know about the characters and then ask them how they know it. What, why do you know that's the case? They're going to know things about the characters. They're going to know things about the problems. They may not be able to tell you how they know, but you can guide them to find that out. So what you're doing is you're, you're essentially working backwards with them then. So every time a child says, that character is angry. Oh, how do you know? Well, because look at how mad their face is or because that character just stole something. Oh, so you, so, so see in the story, you know that this person's angry, but the story never said this person was angry, but you knew it because of what's happening and because of their expression on their face. These are little seeds that you're planting in their minds so that when they are preparing their own story, they are gonna remember that. And they're gonna think, how can I make it so that the reader knows that my character is excited or my character is really sad or my character is shy? They're gonna think about facial expressions. They're gonna think about interactions with other characters. They're gonna be thinking about what the character is saying or what other characters are saying to them. Because it's, it's you pointing it out, being very explicit that helps them understand that. Okay, and then I have, like, I just pulled an example from a Kevin Henke's book. Um, like for example, um, I can tell that Chrysanthemum is scared to go to school because her face looks very worried. That girl is mean because she's pointing to Chrysanthemum and laughing. This is an example of what your child might say to you when, when, you, when you say, what do you think is going on with chrysanthemum? Chrysanthemum, is she excited to go to school or scared to go to school? And they'd say, oh, she's scared. How, how do you know? And then they could explain this. Like, uh, you know, a first grader could explain this to you. A kindergartner probably could explain this to you. So these are concepts that little, little kids get really quickly. Um, another one, I can tell Olivia is happy because she's smiling so big. So these are the, we want to point these things out, get them talking about it, and then say, yes, you are correct. And then this is called character development. The author specifically wanted you to know that Olivia was excited, or the author really wanted the reader to know that Chrysanthemum is terrified of school. Okay, um, let's see, the last thing, um, I have a list of some really great titles um, for ideas to look through with your child to determine conflicts discuss the illustrations, point out how the dialogue is an important part of developing the plot and the character. So these are really good stories, but you know what? These are just ones that I grabbed off of my kid's bookshelf. I'm sure you have a bunch of really great ones off your bookshelves too. If you happen to have these, these are good ones. You can also get them from the library. Um, if you don't have them, find some that work, that work really well. Okay, now um, let's see here. Mini lessons, okay. Just want to make sure I'm not missing anything before I jump into this. Okay, mini lessons. I want to talk about the idea. Let me stop share real quick here. Okay, I want to talk with you about um, the concept of a mini lesson. Has, it, has anybody heard that term before? I've probably brought it up a couple of times, at least in the videos that I've done. So um, if we think about um, we're sitting down with our child and we're teaching them a specific concept, we can think of that five, 10 minutes that we're really going deep on that concept as a mini lesson. So we're, we're, this is our focus time with them. We are explicitly um, bringing their attention to certain things. It's not the time when they're independently working. It is the time that you're talking with your child, you're connecting with your child. Um, or that a teacher in a classroom is explicitly teaching a concept to the class. That's a mini lesson and they're, very, and they're short. So they're short, 
intentionally so that we keep we capture their attention we keep their attention and then we, but we have them progressively in order so i have set this up to show you how to do this sequentially with a bunch of little mini lessons okay um so the first thing that i want to do i want um i want to tell you that all of those pdfs that you printed off or that you're going to have from the step up to writing that that's where a lot of the mini lessons are going to come from for you you've got it it's all right there and it is so like self-explanatory i'm going to go through it with you at the end of this but it's all right there and that's one of the reasons why i love the step up to writing narrative um unit because it's so easy just to look at and go yeah that makes sense and what a great example for me to use with my child they're totally going to pick up on this um okay so now i want to go to my next page here Mm, this one, I think. Yes. Share this one. Okay, so this page, um, we're going to start at the bottom of this first. So your child, um, you know, they're going to know when you start talking with them about these, uh, that they're going to know that you are, you're in the process of preparing to write a story. Um, but they might think, well, I don't have any good ideas for a story. I don't know what I would write about. So I, I came up with this list that you can draw from. And I would absolutely read through this list with your child, with your children. Say, and again, this, this parent workshop, I really want you to understand that this is, this is totally appropriate for little kids, middle school kids, and high schoolers. I mean, this is... The, Seniors in high school would have a lot of fun writing a children's book, trust me. Um, so ideas for writing a story. A lot of times we think that, our that, that it's only valid if the story comes directly from our own child's head. Not true. Do you think that this story came from my child's head, Obi-Wan Kenobi and the Halicrons? No. This came, I don't know, probably a blend of different things. <laughs> Who knows where that came from? I don't know. It did, part of it came from his head and part of it was from Star Wars. But that didn't, it wasn't a problem because I, because of all the aspects of learning that happen in the process of writing this. Okay, so some ideas, a myth. Okay, I don't know if you guys know this or not, but let me tell you, mythology, if you think about this, if you pick up a book of mythology and you open up to a myth like King Midas um, or, or Pandora's box or something, a myth that, that you know, you know is going to be across the board, you know, if it's Greek mythology, all the books are gonna have the same myth, or if it's um, Roman mythology, all the books are gonna have the same myth. You open it up and you read it, and it is going to be 100% different. Well, no, not 100, 75% different. Every story is gonna be so different from each other, but they're gonna have the same characters' names, for the most part, and they're gonna have the same basic storyline. But they're going to be developed so differently. And if there are illustrations, they're going to be so different. And so a really cool idea for this, especially for an older child, is to take a myth that they've connected with that maybe has come up in your curriculum, either last year or this year, or maybe will be coming up and you have them read it. And they, they develop it, they stretch it out. They, maybe they add a couple of characters or maybe they add some more problems or maybe they just really, they just make, they, they just they stretch it out with really cool stuff. Um, this is a really great idea if your child is into mythology for sure. Um, another idea would be a condensed version of their favorite novel. Wonder, awesome book to do this with. <clears throat> if your children haven't read Wonder, it's a, it's a fantastic story and um, totally appropriate for like fifth grade and up, fourth, fifth grade and up. This is, you know, it's, it's a novel for sure, but it's a novel that gets kids hooked. They love it. This would be great. A condensed version, can you imagine? how awesome that would be to be able to sit down with your child and say okay we have 28 pages to work with we have to pick out the 28 most important things from that book that's some serious like academic time right there for them to go through and have to determine what are the most important scenes that i want to pull in to do this i mean just just work, working backward on that i mean it just gets me excited to think about taking a child through that process um, a fairy tale, similar to a myth, fairy tales are also totally different because mythology and fairy tales, these are, these are stories that were passed down over generations orally, and so they're all different. So you just take a base story and you make it your own. How fun. 
Um, a true story. This could be about something interesting that occurred in their life over a brief period. We call that a personal narrative. This is not going to be a personal narrative book, but I wanted, I'm going to be showing you an example probably towards the end of, of an example of a true story, and I'll show you the picture real quick. Um, uh, I don't know if anybody's ever read Humphrey the Lost Whale. So this is a whale that, that truly did get stuck and truly the people of San Francisco helped Humphrey get back out to, to the ocean. And so the author of this story did a beautiful job of developing that and it's very engaging. So I, I have some pictures scanned from that that I'll show you. Um, and then, oh, next one. And I'm gonna all open up the picture for this. Letters to themselves from their favorite toys or the ones that they've grown out of. Have any of you read um, the, Day the crayons quit. Okay, if you have, you know, this is awesome. So I'm gonna just do a really quick transition over here to the day the crayons quit. Um, okay, stop share. Go to my crayons. Mm -hmm. Open up. Share. Okay, so, you know, I said I was trying to be tech savvy, but <clears throat> my scanner, my, my home office scanner is not the best. So bear with me here. Um, it, cu it cuts me off. So then I have to go back and I've got, this is within two different um, scans. So the day the crayons quit is hilarious. Um, I didn't want this uh, to, to make this be a super long parent workshop. So I'm not going to like fully read it. And I only put a few pictures in, but oh my goodness, this is one of the coolest books ever. Okay, so one day in class, Duncan went to take his crayons, take out his crayons, and he found a stack of letters with his name on them. To Duncan. Okay, this is where it stopped, so I've got to open my next one home. Give me one second here. Okay. All right, so the way this book works is that every time you turn the page, you have a new letter from that crayon to Duncan, and then a picture that that crayon was used in illustrating. So here's the first one. Hey Duncan, it's me, Red Crayon. We need to talk. You make me work harder than any of your other crayons. All year long I wear myself out coloring fire engines, apples, strawberries, and everything else that's red. I even work on holidays. I have to color all the Santas at Christmas and all the hearts on Valentine's Day. I need a rest. Your overworked friend, Red Cram. Okay, and then the next one. Well, I, I skipped a few pages. Dear Duncan, you color with me, but why? Most of the time, I'm the same color as the page you are using me on, white. If I didn't have a black outline, you wouldn't even know I was there. I'm not even in the rainbow. I'm only used to color snow or to fill in empty space between other things. And it leaves me feeling, well, empty. We need to talk. Your empty friend, White Cram. White Cat in the Snow by Duncan, and then a picture of him. Okay, so that, that's all I uh, was able to get copied out of that. But um, the reason that I wanted to share that with you, am I back? Am I back, Katrina? Can you see me? Okay. The reason that I wanted to share that with you is that um, years ago, I don't remember how many years ago, but um, years ago when I was introduced to the day the crayons quit at a, like a, a teacher workshop, and I was like, no that's the coolest thing I've ever seen. I have to do that. So of course I ran and I bought the book from Barnes and Noble and I was so excited. I was like, this is the coolest thing in the whole world. And I read it to my son and I said, what do you, you want to do? We didn't make a story, but I said, do you want to do some writing? And he's like, yeah. And I said, well, wh why don't you pick like a couple of your toys and write letters to yourself from the perspective or the point of view of your toys? What would your toys be frustrated with you about? What would they be excited about? What would they say to you? And wouldn't you know it, I did not go digging through his stuff to find, I know it's somewhere in my office because I had set it aside a while ago to share, but he wrote the most creative letters to himself. One was from the perspective of his army men, because he used to set his army men up and set up these little battle scenes all over his room. And he had so much fun and he could play for hours setting up these army men, and the, but he hadn't played with them in a long time. So he, he had this 
this really creative thing. He just, he just went and sat in his room and he just wrote and he came out and he had this whole page of his army guys talking to him. And I remember clearly one of them was like, do you remember the battle of uh, blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. And when you set up this and that, and I mean, I was just like tears in my eyes when I was reading it. It was so adorable. And so like, I mean, the epitome of creative, right? So when we come across things that we're like, our heart just goes, oh, that's awesome. There's a reason for that. We want to try to tap into it. So back to um, what we were talking about with where could we go with some really cool ideas? This is one. Do, this is not a full, fully developed story, right? We don't, I mean, we kind of have a beginning, middle, and an end. There is an ending to it, but um, like where there's like a resolution, all the crayons, each color airs out its grievances in the letter and it's just totally cute. Um, and then at the end, Duncan comes up with a, a plan to incorporate them all really creatively into a picture using colors that he's not supposed to use for certain things. And, you know, and then he gets an A for creativity. Um, so we could call this a story with the beginning, middle and end, and then with different conflicts. But it doesn't, but I guess the point I'm trying to make is that if you want to go that route, if you want to get super creative and have your kids do, do that, you know, break this into chapters, right? Maybe the Legos are going to be chapter one. Maybe the stuffed animals are chapter two. Maybe the dinosaurs are chapter three. I mean, Nerf guns, hello, <laughs> you know, <laughs> Nerf water guns. Water guns get really upset in the wintertime because they just get totally ignored and dust all over them. And, you know, <laughs> I mean, you can have some lot of fun with that. Break it into chapters. Yeah. Okay. I want to show you um, that um, the Humphrey the Lost Whale. That's the next thing I want to show you. It's going to take me just a second to find it, though. So bear with me. Okay. And Lori, I remember you showing us that picture book that Cole made in the Developing Competent Writers workshop. So um, if you guys have watched that workshop or you want to see that adorable book that he made, she shows us in that workshop. Are you talking about the where he had his toys talking to him? Yes. Oh, okay. So he didn't turn it into a book. It was, it was writing that he did. It was just, I never, I never had him take it to the book stage. Well, you showed was, examples of it. So if anyone wants okay. to see it, I remember how cute it was. Okay. I was just so delighted. I didn't even take it to final draft stage. I was just like, oh, this is precious. And I just want to keep it right where it's at with his, with his handwriting and his misspellings. It's just so adorable. I couldn't stand it. It's, you know, there's just some things that you just have to keep right as they are. <laughs> okay. Humphrey the Lost Well. So one of the ideas that I gave you is a true story. Okay. And I want to be really explicit about this, that there's a big difference between, so, so it, it's all lumped under narrative writing. Narrative writing is, is a storytelling writing and it could be retelling a situation or an event that happened to them. But, but in education, we, we tend to, um, here's how we address this. Um, you know, tell about, tell about what happened in your summer or think of a scary, scary situation that you had and talk about it and retell it. That's like a personal narrative. When they're, think about a, an argument that you had with somebody and, and write about that argument, right? And so they're, the teacher or, or you as the parent, if you're doing a personal narrative through your curriculum, you're writing a paper. A personal narrative is not a storybook, okay? It, yes, it has a beginning, a middle, and an end, but it's a paper. And we're teaching them um, all the same things, but it's totally different than writing a, a children's storybook or something. Um, so this, so that's why I wanted to pull this in to show you the, the difference here. So that if your child says, I want to write about Christmas morning, you could say, okay, well, if you want to write about something, a real life thing, let's think of a really big deal, real life thing that happened. Like how about the earthquake, you know, something big deal that they lived through that they could legitimately write a story about. Um, it doesn't, you know, I'm, I, I'm not saying squash your child's idea but realize that you have to be able to get enough out of it to fill the book, probably, or to, to be able to develop the different aspects that you want to develop. And, it, and, and if all they can come up with is Christmas morning or a scary thing that happened to them and they want to talk about it, then you know what, go with it. That, that's also okay. All right, so the idea here though, again, is that there is action. So we've got the illustrations there's action happening. That's what I really wanted to point out. Okay, so I just I just grabbed a few of the shots from this. 
So do you see the people with their arms raised high? This little kid is like, yay, you know, this person's leaning back. Everybody's attention is on them. This person in the boat is like super excited. Their arms are up in the air. Humphrey's clearly going the right direction. The illustration directly matches the text. Okay, so we know how these people are feeling because of what we're seeing in their, their, late, their body language. And so again, talking about the background, what's happening in the background, the foreground, I mean, it's almost like art lessons too, right? Like we're pulling art into this big time and, you know, and it doesn't really matter even what they do for their illustrations, it's still valid, beautiful artwork. Um, okay, and again, like what's happening in this picture? So you, in any book where you've got, you've got a beautiful example of um, a scene, get your children to tell you what they see. And, and if they're like, I, I don't know people on a bridge, say, well, do the people look upset? No, they look happy. How do you know? Well, they're smiling. Okay, awesome. How many people are smiling? Oh yeah, oh, and okay. Oh, and this kid's got his leg up and his arms in the air. Okay, and, and this person has their arms in the air. Oh, so, you know, that's nonverbal body language. That's body language. And that's part of developing the story. That's characterization. So we just, we explicitly discuss these things with them. Okay, and then, oh, look at this, big celebration, big. Even look at the lines coming up from this person's arms. So every time you, am I back fully? Are we on the, okay. <clears throat> every time you're, you're going through a book with your child and you are explicitly pointing these things out, think of it like planting seeds. It's, they're never gonna leave their mind. You're planting these little nuggets of like these seeds of all the things that go into a story. And the next time you read a story to them that day, or, you know, who knows how long later, or they pick up a story and they're reading it to themselves, they're going to be explicitly looking at all of those things. So, so you teach it to them once, and then they're going to start to naturally do it. And so when they're putting it in practice and they're writing their own book, they're going to be thinking about it. You're not even going to have to tell them to do it. They're going to be thinking about it. But here's the good news. The step up to writing is going to help you tell them to do it if they don't, <laughs> okay. All right, the next thing I wanna show you, um, okay, the alternative version of a popular story or fairy tale. You guys have probably seen these. So we have, um, I have as an example, I'm just, gonna, can I just hold it up because so I don't have to keep going back and forth, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, the Three Little Wolves and the Big Bad Pig. Okay, so how fun would that be to take a story that they love and flip it? So much fun. There are so many books like this, you guys, that you can find um, at the library, maybe even in our library, I don't know, but off Amazon. Um, there are so, this has become a really cool little genre where they flip the popular story. Um, so there's like Cinderella. Um, so we can... There, there's the flipping it and changing the characters, like in this case, instead of three little pigs, it's three little wolves and the big bad pig, or there's changing the point of view. So there's like a, a couple different versions where Cinderella is told from the perspective or the point of view of the wicked stepmother and not from Cinderella. So that, that's another fun twist that you can do. Okay, um, let's see here. Point of view. Okay, now we're going to talk point of view. So I've got some, so this paper, sorry, I've got my notes all over it, but this paper right here, you can see that there's some links, right? This one right here. Okay, so I just finished this part. Now I'm back up here. So there's links. And this is, um, Katrina, did we get this included, the, the, the link to the Google Doc? I don't remember seeing it. No, I didn't include the link, but they all have that specific page with the links. They all got that. You have it, but you don't have it linked. Okay, so you'll be able to find it though. So I'm gonna show you each one of these, okay? So we're gonna start with point of view. Now, you all know what point of view is, right? First person, third person, third person limited, omniscient, I, you write this, but, but then the question is, but how do I teach that to my kid, right? <laughs> Are they old enough to learn that? Is that gonna be confusing? You bet they're old enough to learn that. In first grade, they're old enough to learn that, yes. And it's also something that once they learn it, you can, as you're reading stories with them, you can say, hey, what point of view is this? Is this in? And they can, you know, they'll throw a guess and you'll say, how do you know? Show me how you know. And then they'll be able to tell you. Or if they're not, you can tell them. Well, the character keeps saying, I, me, my. 
that's first person. Oh yeah, that's right. First person. It's the character talking to us. Okay. So I'm going to go, I'm going to show you a very cool video that I found. Um, first a, a website and then a video. So if I want you guys to write something down, the first thing I'm going to take you to, I do not have written down on this paper. So I'd like you to write this down real quick. Um, it's titled English units on YouTube. Okay. I'm going to, I have to close my 50,000 windows I have open here real quick from <laughs> all these things I've been showing you guys. Um, and see if I can find, got it open. Okay, here we go. So let me make it big screen, share. Okay, so this, oh, let me go out of this real quick. This um, right here below the, the point of view screen here, this lady right here, you see her picture? Her, her, her YouTube channel is called English Units. I've watched just a couple of her videos just to see if they'd be good ones to pass on. I think they're good. I think they're valid. I think you could watch it with your child and they would be engaged. So I'm going to just um, sh show you a brief clip of this so that you can get a sense of this. I watched several today and several of them are like, no gag, my kid would not even pay attention to that, right? <laughs> as an adult, I appreciate this. And if I wasn't sure what this meant, I would like learning it this way as an adult, but children need it to be a little bit more engaging. So this is a, this is a pretty decent one. Okay. Point of view part one, video and worksheet. In this video, you're going to learn about different points of view, including first person, second person, and third person point of view. While you listen to the video, use the worksheet to take notes and practice. So what is point of view? Point of view is the perspective or eyes a story is told from. So for example, here's our narrator. The narrator is the person who tells the story. The area shown in blue is the narrator's point of view. The point of view includes everything that the narrator sees from the angle of her eyes. Let's look at another point of view. Here's a child who wants to play with the other children. His point of view is shown in green. He sees the same things as the girl, but if he's the narrator, the story will be a little different because his point of view is a little different from hers. Here's one more interesting point of view. The point of view of a bird in the sky. And again, even though the bird is looking at the same things. Okay. So I just wanted to show you just to that point of the bird in the sky. Um, and then if you look, you can still see this, right? You guys, can everyone still see this? Okay. Um, so if you click on her um, link right here, it takes you to her website where she has some, some pretty decent um, worksheets you can print off to, to use as a mini lesson. So this would be a mini lesson, watching this video and doing the worksheet with them. That's a mini lesson. Boom, you're done. You've covered point of view. Um, and then you just kind of bring it up. You just talk about it randomly as you're working through. All right, the next thing I want to show you is, um, what's the next one? Fiction books that help teach. Okay, I didn't open that one. Give me just a second to find this exact website. I just forgot to open this. Yes, it's this one. Okay. Okay, so this this website, um, I, I you can find it. It is linked, but we didn't get the the Google. Um, th this isn't a Google Doc, but we didn't get that attached for you guys. Um, but all I did is just type into Google this exact thing: fiction books that help teach point of view, and this website comes up. Um, so you can see the day the crayons quit. That's in there as an example. Um, there's some really good ones. And here's why I wanted to um, include this particular website is that she gives a little synopsis of each of these books that are excellent, excellent resources. I actually have Hey Little Ant also in my pile. I just didn't do pictures of it. Um, and then familiar fairy tales told from a different point of view. So if you, if you want to, to if, you're, if you're talking with your child, um, and this is really good even for the older kids too, because they've got a lot of life experiences and they've got some pretty fun creativity going on and, and they understand irony. And um, if you want to do this, this flipped idea, 
you're going to want to show them some examples. Really good examples are like the key to really good output from your kids. So what I love about this website is that she shows you some really good examples, right? Some really good stuff. So anyway, this, this is a good resource. Okay, moving on to the next thing. I would like to show you IXL. Um, does, can, I'm, I can kind of see you guys a little bit. Has anybody here experienced IXL yet? Okay. Okay, a little bit. All right. So I love, love, love IXL. When you get on, when you go into IXL, this is the first thing you see. Okay. You see um, that they've got um, from pre-K all the way through 12th grade, and then they also have a Spanish section. They have, um, it is math, science, math, language, arts, science, and social studies, and now also Spanish. Um, so, so the reason that I wanted to show this to you is that I, I keep talking about the concept of a mini lesson. So let's say you're like, okay, Lori, well, I did point of view, but my child didn't really get it. Like kind of got it and I don't have any other practice to do. And I don't want to watch another YouTube video with them. I want them practicing it. Right? So, Hey, okay. So we've got, let's say we're in fifth grade. Let, we click on language arts and we're looking for point of view. Now, I don't even have to look at all these awesome things that IXL does for us. I don't even have to read through all these. I can just go up here to the search topics and skills and type in point of view and look at that. Oh, whoops. I want to actually show you the, the easier perspective of that. I'm trying again. Sorry. Before I click. Okay. Now, if I don't click anything and I leave that up there, this is kind of neat. Look. You can see everywhere they've got narrative point of view in every grade level. So I'm gonna go ahead and just click on the fifth grade level. And let me log in as, now you can, you can um, sign in as a guest. Okay, so let me show you this. So we have an account. I've, we've been using IXL, oh my goodness, <clears throat> probably since second grade. And he's a freshman now. Um, I don't use it intensively every year. I've had years where I've used it more. I don't care, it's worth it to me. It is worth the money. I pay for it one time, and then I just get reimbursed for that one time. So I'm not having to do every month for a little amount. I just buy the year's worth. Um, and I, I'm gonna tell you, I, I feel very strongly that this is an amazing resource because no matter what you're teaching them, if they, you, nobody wants to go digging through curriculum trying to find more practice for exactly that one concept. Am I right? Like that's the worst. I mean, it takes up time. You've lost your kid's attention and you're like, oh, this is kind of like it, but not exactly what I want. IXL makes it easy to get exactly what you want. You can log in as your child and then every single thing they do is tracked and you get reports and everything. You can log in as a parent and do the, see everything that your child sees for the, the lessons and the, um, the, the questions, but nothing is tracked. So you can practice on the parent route and then switch it over to the child and then all their stuff is, is uh, you, you can go in and see what they've done. So like it, it says, parent results are not recorded. So here's an example. IXL gives you a very high quality question. You have to pick the answer. Okay, so the point of view, does the narrator use? Um, so here's what I would do. I would use this and would, this would be part of my mini lesson with my child. We'd, I would have my child read it to me and then I'd say, what do you think? First person, second person, or third person? I don't know, mom. Well, I'm gonna remind you, first person, the speaker is talking directly to the reader. So the speaker is saying like, I this, I that. Oh, well then it's first person. How do you know? Well, because I, I, I. Aha, you are correct, first person. The other ones don't do that. So we click on it, we get immediate feedback. If it's wrong, so let's do another one. So I'm gonna click on first person here. If it's wrong, look at what happens. Oops, click submit. Sorry, incorrect. Here's the correct answer, and then it explains it. And then it explains it a little bit more. And then you click got it and you keep going. This is just, it's just a really great resource. So you, so you can use this. The other thing I wanna tell you is that I think I mentioned right at the beginning of when I started discussing IXL, IXL allows you to, um, to do up to a certain number of problems for free every day. So that's kind of cool. You can try it and see if it works, works out for you or not before you, you pay for it. So I appreciate that they do that. They, they, that little box will pop up, but you could just X out of it and it'll let you bypass it. 
Okay, <clears throat> before we move further, does anybody have any questions about IXL specifically that I can answer before? Yes. So if you have more than one kid, do you have to pay like different, uh, like, uh, I guess for each kid you have to pay like for a different account or can you just add on to one account? So that's a really good question. Um, I, I've only ever had one child on here. Um, so I don't, well, I don't know if it's that much more per other children, but it would say in here, um, somewhere up in here. <laughs> Kristen did some research for us, and so it says it's from $79 to $159 a year, and then it's $40 for each additional child. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for telling us that. Um, and I'm going to tell you guys it's, it's worth it. It's just, it's just worth it. So, again, because it goes with any curriculum, anything you're doing, you've got math, all the math skills for every grade, all the language arts skills for every grade, much of what they learn in social studies, much of what they learn in science, science through eighth grade only. Um, okay, so I'm going to stop sharing that now. And the next thing I want to do, oh, okay. Teaching character development with character traits and conflict. And then I'm going to read a story to you and model what you will do with your child. Okay. So this is, a, this is the third link that you see on that paper. Amy Lemons, okay. She's, she's so cute. I love this page. <laughs> And I, I mean, she's cute physically, but she's just got a cute personality. You can tell by when you read through her ideas, she's got some really great resources available for anybody who wants them. And this is, this is right on the money. This is, this is really good stuff right here. So what she's talking about here is teaching character development with character traits and conflict. So this is the next thing that we're going to be moving into in this um, parent workshop is talking about developing the characterization, developing the plot with the problems that happen to the characters, the conflicts and what those different types of conflicts are. So what she's showing is, and she talks very, very she explains this very well how to do it. Yes, she's a classroom teacher, but what she's doing totally applies to you at home with your child, okay? Um, it's beautiful stuff. And so I'm not gonna take the time to read through this, but I'm just gonna, I, want, I would like you to, because it's gonna, it's, it just, it makes sense and you're gonna really enjoy it. Okay, now I'm gonna read to you and I'm gonna model this, okay? I'm modeling what you just saw on that website. This is important. I'm modeling it for you because this is what you are gonna do with your child. Okay, give me one sec here. Okay, who knows Kevin Henke's? He's my favorite. He's my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> He's an author and an illustrator, and um, if you don't have any, if you don't have Kevin Henke's in your life, like you just need to get him in your life. Um, Kevin Henke's, uh, his characters are mice, okay, and they are filled with personality, and the stories are all um, related to problems that children have, and he just he just goes on the extreme end of developing characterization and conflict. And the kids love everything Kevin Henke's is amazing. Before I jump into Sheila Ray's, I'm gonna actually show you, I did pull off some pictures of Lily. Um, let's see here, open Lily. Okay, anybody know about Lily's purple plastic purse? You do, yay! Okay, Lily, oh my goodness. <laughs> we found out about Lily when my daughter was five um, and fell in love with Kevin Henke's at that point. Um, so I actually don't have the book because my daughter, you know, I went digging through the bookshelves to pull out all of my Kevin Henke's ones because I was going to, you know, I wanted to use them. And we probably had like, I don't know, eight or nine of them. And um, that little stinker took them all to Japan with her. She's a mom now, and before she left, she raided the bookshelves. And she took all the Kevin Henke's except for these two. <laughs> I don't know how these made it. They got hidden beside behind something. She has a daughter now, so she's recognizing the value of these awesome books. All right, let's see here. Um, here's another Lily I wanna show you. Let's see, stop share. Click on that. Okay, just wanna give you a little snapshot here. Lily, look, can you guys see this big? Cause it's small for me. Okay. Lily loved the privacy of her very own desk. Look at that picture. 
I mean, isn't that like the epitome of, oh, she loved the fish sticks and the chocolate milk every Friday in the lunchroom. Straws make everything taste better. I mean, she's precocious. She's the ultimate precocious little character. Um, but most of all, she loved her teacher, Mr. Slinger, for you. And so this, this would be an example to say, okay, what do we know? We know a lot about Lily from the narrator telling us about Lily. We know that she loves school. We know from the words, but we also know from her face and we know from her actions, the scenes. We, there's something happening in each one of these little pictures so we can tell how happy Lily is at school. It's like, it's her place. Okay, now I wanna show you Mr. Slinger. <laughs> okay, stop share. I wish there was a faster way to do this. probably is for faster people. Okay, okay, Mr. Slinger. Instead of greeting students or good morning pupils, Mr. Slinger winked and said, howdy. He thought that desks in rows were old fashioned and boring. Do you rodents think you can handle a semicircle? So, okay, so, th so this is where I would stop <clears throat> if I was using this in a mini lesson and, I, and say, okay, so we talked about how, you know, the pictures match up with the words, the action is happening. But what about the, there's also dialogue in here. The author is telling us what Mr. Slinger says. How do we know that it's his words? And then we talk about the quotation marks. And then what about the words he is using? Do you enjoy the way he's talking? Are these creative words? Like howdy? Would you love it if a teacher said that to you? And would, wouldn't, wouldn't you laugh if a teacher said, do you rodents think you can handle a semicircle? Because you wouldn't expect it. And so that's another thing to talk about is things that we don't expect and that make us laugh. Those are really cool things to pull into a story too. Okay, so we're gonna stop there. I'm all done sharing that. And now we'll go back to, now I'm, I'm gonna model for you, okay. Now he doesn't, he has a lot of boy characters. So I have an example, here's another Kevin Henke's Chester's Way. So, you know, but boys love, uh, the girl ones too because they're just really good. I mean like my son loved Lily's purple plastic purse. It was one of his favorite books um, but he really really likes these these boy ones. Okay so this is a baby toddler book that I'm going to use. I'm going to model with this one okay and I'm going to read it to you. Okay so Sheila Ray's peppermint stick. So I've got a bunch of sticky notes so you'll do this with sticky notes and a marker okay snuggled up on the couch together. <clears throat> I'm going to take these off as I go and I'm going to show you how you use the sticky notes and, and the talking okay this is going to be a little tricky okay because I want to make sure you can see it is it big for you guys can you see it big okay Sheila Ray had a peppermint stick it was long and striped and thin and sweet okay so here's what I'm going to say how is Sheila Ray feeling do you think and then my child will say happy well how do you know like you, you ask these things. Well, she's smiling, she's dancing, she has candy. Yep, she's definitely happy. Okay. Did the author say Sheila Ray was happy? No. Did the author have to say Sheila Ray was happy? Well, no, because the author is showing it in the picture. So this is, again, as you're explicitly saying this, because otherwise our kids think, well, I have to describe what's happening in the picture. Sheila Ray was very happy because she had a peppermint stick. We don't have to say that, right? You see what I'm saying? So you, you, wanna, you wanna take every opportunity to tell them what it doesn't have to be because it is this way. So sticky notes, I just have this right here, just to remind myself what to say to you. But I would put a, so, so here's what I would say. Actually, okay, with a sticky note, you would say, okay, Sheila Ray is happy. And we know because she's smiling, dancing, and holding up her candy. We would write that on there and stick it on there. Maybe even have your child write that and stick it on there. And then I would say, okay, you know, stories, they start with a beginning. You know, all the kids know this. They know the beginning. They know that terminology. They start with the beginning. This is the beginning of this story. So we're going to put a sticky that says beginning. Okay. Boom. And after the beginning, we start, we get to, we start to work up to the first conflict. I'm going to take that off. Okay. <clears throat> You see that okay? Oh, I've got to turn my body, sorry. <laughs> Louise wanted it. Please, she said. Okay. What do we know about Louise so far? 
And the child says, well, she really wants the candy. Yeah, we can tell, right? What else? Does she look scared? No. Does she look sad? No. It's like, like you say the opposite, right? Does she look nervous? Yeah. Does she look maybe a little bit worried? Yeah, how can you tell? Well, right above the eyeball, the brow is the opposite way it should be when it come in Zoom. See that? The kids pick up on this stuff. Crazy, right? And you say, wow, so you saw that and you knew that she was worried from that one little teeny detail. Wow, I did see that, that's pretty cool. You've just planted another seed. When they're doing their illustrations, they're gonna be thinking of that. Okay, so, um, so what do we know about Louise that? And then we're gonna say, guess what? This is, and you're not going to do the, with the first time you do this, you're just gonna start to throw this idea out there, but you're not gonna go deep. You're gonna say, that she's having a problem. What's her problem? Well, she wants the candy. Do you think she's gonna get it? Maybe, we don't know yet, but is it a problem maybe for her? Yeah, okay, we call that a conflict in the story. So we're gonna stick conflict on there because that's the first conflict in the story. Okay, now. Okay. <clears throat> You can have one lick if you can guess how many stripes there are, said Sheila Ray. Huh. Is Sheila Ray being fair? No. How do, you know, they would say no. How does Louise feel? Sad. How do you know Louise feels sad? Well, again, look at her body language. That is not a happy girl. How about Sheila Ray? How does she feel? Like she's kind of being mean and she's kind of like, lording it over her that she has this candy and she's not gonna share it and it's making her happy. Hmm. So how do you feel about Sheila Ray right now? I don't, I don't really like her. I wouldn't want someone to do that to me. So we have this conversation. So you know what, we're, we're started the middle of the story. That was the beginning and now we're starting the middle of our story. We just hit the middle. And you know what else? There's another problem going on, isn't there? Yup, because Sheila Ray is being mean to Louise there's another problem, that's a conflict, okay? And we're not gonna say what kind it is, we're just gonna say that's a conflict right there. Okay. <clears throat> Louise thought and thought and thought. 13-7, she said. Wrong, said Sheila Ray, too bad. Is that a problem? Yes. She, had, she made her do math and, she said, and then she said wrong and she didn't even help her. That's a problem, yep, there's another conflict. Please, said Louise, you can have one lick if you can reach it, said Sheila Ray. Sheila Ray climbed onto a stool and some pillows and some books. And I didn't put conflict, but that would be another one because she's getting it up out of her way. Okay. And then what is Louise thinking right now? She looks scared. She does. How do you know? Well, her eyes are really big. What do you think she's thinking? That she's never going to be able to reach it. Probably. Louise sighed. Too high. If I had two, I'd give you one, said Sheila Ray. But I don't. Too bad. So what do you think of Sheila Ray right now? I think she's mean, and I think she's being mean to Louise, and I don't like that. Yeah. Is this a conflict? Yes. This is a problem. Okay. And then, and oh, and by the way, we were still in the middle at that point, okay? We don't, we don't keep telling them middle. We just identify when we hit it. And that we just identify beginning, middle, climax. You know what I mean? We just, just the, the, the key point. Just then Sheila Ray stumbled. The books fell, the pillows fell, the stool flipped over or tipped over. The peppermint stick broke in half. Whoa. Is there a problem here? Yes, there is a problem here. Okay, there's another conflict. Guess what else? This is the climax of the story. It's the high point. The big deal thing just happened in this story. That's called the climax. Oh, okay. You know, we don't go deep on it right then. We just let it, we just introduce it. <clears throat> now there are two, said Louise. Okay, this is what we're going to call the falling action if you even want to talk about that with them. Depending on their age, you don't have to. Sheila Ray had a peppermint stick. It was short and striped and thin and sweet. And Louise had one too. So we're going to call this the resolution. And then the very last page. I was
is going to give you some all along. Okay, and then, then we say, okay, well, that's, that's the ending. So we had the beginning, the middle, and the ending. We had a lot of conflicts that built up to the big problem in the story. What do you think about Sheila right now? Why? Okay, okay, so that's how you, that's how you do that. It's really easy. Go to that website and get some ideas of how to do that too, because that'll make it, it'll just make a lot of sense. Okay, so next. Oh my goodness, we're at the PDFs. Oh, you guys are really hanging in there, thank you. Okay, so if you have them printed off, we're at the PDFs. You may have only printed off the, the, the ones for the younger crowd. They're all gonna be very, very similar. So I've got two piles here, but I'm, I'm really gonna just talk through the older group because here's, what I, here's my thought on this. <clears throat> I just, I wanted to provide the ones for the, the, that come in the curriculum for the younger children just in case, because everybody's at a different place of how deep they want to go into this, right? So you've got the basics here in this little one. But in the thicker one, in the older group, you have everything you could possibly even think of needing, except point of view. That wasn't in here. There was a point of view lesson, but I thought I didn't like the way it was necessarily like, it was a good point of view lesson, but could have been really tricky for younger kids. And so I just thought, you know, we're just gonna address that in a slightly different way. So that's the only thing missing from this. Okay, so the first thing that, that you're going to do when you start to, um, when you start to really talk about, um, I mean, you can even do this first, like the very first thing you could say, there are two broad categories of writing. Did everybody know that there are two broad categories? Well, now they've, they're, they're now saying there's technically a third category. So they've it used to be, when I was teaching, <clears throat> it was two broad categories, expository and narrative. This particular curriculum has adjusted to reflect the changing kind of philosophy in the world of education to say, persuasive really needs to be its own category of writing. And I believe that that could be partly, I think that a lot of that has to do with the push to teach kids about um, ethos, pathos, and logos and all, all that whole persuasive realm. Um, and it's being taught, it used to just be taught in college. Now it's, it's being taught in like, I mean, some middle schools, and, but you know, definitely like freshman year of high school. Um, and so, so now, so you see this, but I don't have the updated version of Step Up. I don't have the brand new one where they've changed it. Okay, so I just wanna clarify. Right now, expository on this includes persuasive. So we're gonna talk as if there's two broad categories, okay? So we're going to start on the left of this of this paper. Oh, let me put let me open this. I'm I'm sorry. Some of you don't even have this. Give me a one second to open it. Okay. Share. Okay. There we go. So two broad categories of writing expository um, we can we can remember this if we think about the word explain when we're explaining something we're giving information when we're expressing ideas we're expressing our our opinions on something our thoughts on something we are it's expository so that would be like when we're comparing and contrasting we're critiquing we're persuading identifying showing cause and effect explaining teaching a process all of this and so we when we talk to our kids about this, we can say, we can just really make it simplistic and we could say, where would we find that kind of writing? Well, I don't know. Well, would you find that kind of writing in the newspaper, a newspaper article? Does a newspaper article tell us information? Yes. Okay, well then that would be expository. What about your science textbook? Is that telling you information? Yes, that's expository, okay. Um, and you know, we've been learning about paragraphs and you've been writing paragraphs, that's expository. So we have, we have a very special kind of structure with expository writing, paragraphs where we have a topic sentence and the supportive details and the conclusion sentence. And then we have the other side where we have narrative writing. Narrative writing, that's stories. And that's the kind of writing we're gonna start doing now. We're moving into a narrative writing and you're going to learn all about writing a story. 
And um, so these are the different types of things that fall under narrative. The books that we read in the evening, novels, even the writing that um, is like behind a cartoon, that's narrative writing. The storyline for a cartoon, the storyline for a movie, um, <clears throat> mythology, all of these. And then we can talk again. This is, this is actually a pretty, a pretty important concept right here. In that when we're talking about expository writing, we need to be using the language of the introduction, the body, and the conclusion. So the introduction, if it's an essay, that's the beginning, that's the first paragraph. The introduction, if it's a paragraph, that's the topic sentence. It's, it's letting the reader know the main idea of the paragraph. That's the introduction. And then we have the body of the writing and then the conclusion where we wrap it up. And so that, that's a very specific format. And you can show them examples. You can open up any textbook to any paragraph and be able to pick that out and say, look, there is a topic sentence. We know what the paragraph will be about. Here are supportive details. Sometimes there'll be a conclusion and sometimes there won't be. This textbook is not telling us a story. This textbook is providing information to us. But narrative writing, that's storytelling, and that is, follows this structure, the beginning, the middle, and the ending. And guess what else? Stories have characters, they have a setting, they have plot, they have events, they have conflicts, which are the problems, they have a climax, and they have a solution. Okay, so breaking down the, the kind of two broad categories. And then here's an example that you can read together. Here's an example of expository writing where the subject is dolphins. Here's an example narrative. Again, the subject is dolphins, but you can talk about the difference between the two. Okay, on the left side, we have an example um, of an informal outline for an expository paragraph. Have any of you already watched any of the videos on paragraph structure that I did? Yep, okay then you've, you've seen this. this. This is that outline, the star key ideas, and then the E's over here. But the basic framework for a narrative is going to be the beginning, things that occur in the middle, and then the ending. And we can use this as a quick guide to just kind of sketch out a plan of what we want to write for a narrative. Okay, this is just something I created really quick for you guys to show you. And when I, when I teach um, with kids, I just draw it out on paper. Um, it, so really it's just, you, you wanna draw this, this kind, can you guys see my mouse on the screen, by the way? Okay, so you wanna start over here and say, okay, this is the beginning, and I didn't write this on here, but if you happen to have a copy of this, just write, this is the beginning right here. And then we start, whoops, we start to work up towards the climax of the story, also known as the high point in the story, where the conflict is the strongest. Now, why do we even want to keep reading a story? Why, why don't we put books down? Why don't we get bored of a good book? Well, because there's constantly problems. There are constantly conflicts that the characters are having to deal with that keep us interested. And so those conflicts, those are these things right here. Now, that was hard to get what I wanted on here when I was doing it through Word, but you want to draw like a jagged, kind of like envision like a mountain with like those jagged peaks going up. So each peak is like another problem that the character is having to deal with <clears throat> until they get to the top. And so then literally we could, we could do Sheila Ray's peppermint stick with this plot line. This is called the plot line right here. And we could write on this plot line and we could say, well, the setting, where is the story happening? Well, maybe in their house. It looks like it's maybe in their house and could have been in one of their bedrooms, but the author didn't give us a lot of information. Um, but, but we kind of got a sense because she had a chair with pillows, so maybe in her bedroom. Um, usually the setting identifies where it's happening right at the beginning. This one didn't, but it's just a chubby cardboard book, right? So, um, but when is it happening? Who's the main character? Sheila Ray is the main character. Um, and then the rising action is what we call where we have these conflicts that the character faces. And so we could write in here the problems. We could actually write the very first problem. We would write it right on the first little peak of the first jagged peak going up. We would just like write a sentence like to the left of it. And then what was the climax? Remember we said what the climax was. Oh, it was when she fell. 
and broke the, the candy. Okay, so when Sheila Ray fell and broke the candy, we would just write that there. And then what happened in the falling action and what happened at the end, she, they hugged and gave a kiss and said, she said, I was gonna give you some. Okay, now the types of conflicts. So if, you, if you're not already aware of this terminology, um, it's, it's person versus person, person versus self, person versus society, person versus nature, and person versus destiny. With, with younger kids, um, person versus destiny is quite often not included in curriculum. So with younger kids, you can skip it. If, however, you're going to be doing mythology with this, you want to pull the person versus destiny in because that's an important overwhelming theme with mythology is that if something's happening out of my control um, or it's fate, it's destiny. <coughs> so here's where kids can get tricked with this. Okay, so I want to caution you. Um, Sheila Ray is not a person. She's a mouse. So here's what I tell them. Well, could the characters be robots? Yeah. Could the characters be bugs? Yeah. So do we have to say person versus person? Could we say character versus character? Yeah. Okay, then that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna say character versus character, character versus self, character versus nature. Do you see what I'm saying? So you can explain that this is the official terminology for it, but really we're talking about character. Okay, um, and now moving down. So uh, now we're talking about transitions. So these are some beautiful narrative transitions. Expository transitions on the left, narrative ones on the right. So if you've been doing any expository writing with your child so far, you've probably, especially if you've been using any of the stuff that I've put out there with these videos, you've probably already talked about transitions. Um, you, haven't, I haven't yet provided you any narrative transitions. Narrative transitions are very specific. And if you take a minute and look at some of these, you can see, oh yeah, it makes sense. Definitely these are more specific to telling a tale. Okay, now we've got a good quick breakdown of creating a narrative in steps. So that's pretty nice, right? I'm just gonna flip through this because you guys are gonna have it. And then we have the high school version of a narrative for a quick sketch. You can find a sample narrative for younger child. Um, just Google sample narrative for younger kids. If you, um, Katrina, did I take everybody to the thoughtful learning website on the last parent workshop or the summary writing workshop? I do not know. Okay, so so I, so if I have, if you've watched my other videos, I, I took out in one of them, I took you guys to the thoughtful learning website where they have a bunch of mini lessons. In fact, you know what, right at the end, I'll take you guys there and show you. I meant to include that in my notes. So please remind me, Katrina, that I want to show them the thoughtful learning website. So you can find a bunch of um, samples to print off uh, for all different grade levels, um, which, which again, having good examples is really helpful. Okay, so do you remember how I told you that um, we're not writing an essay, we're not writing a narrative essay, we're writing a story that's, that's I mean, you could if you want, but if you want to turn it into a book, that's, that's a whole different ball game, right? But when your child is writing their story, they might write it like this. That's great, there's nothing wrong with that. But then you should sit down with them and say, let's think about the action that's happening. Where does it make sense? To, if, we're, if we're thinking about pages, where would it make sense to turn the page in this story? Everywhere it makes sense to turn the page, draw a line, and when you're done, cut it out. Glue stick it onto the template, or tape it to the template, or lay the templates out and stick the paper on there. You know what I'm saying? So that you can get a sense of the flow of it. And, whether, and then, oh my gosh, we've got six pages that are empty in our book. What are we gonna do? Well, let's find some places we can add some more. We can develop it a little bit more. That's why the template's going to be so helpful. Um, but you could, if you wanted to, you could even use this and just cut this up and use it as a sample. Um, so I have a blank of this right here. So this is an example of, of doing a really fast, quick sketch. So in the beginning, here's what happens. So see the sketching of, the, of what the idea would be for the pictures. And then in the middle, there's one, two, three, four conflicts. You see, these would be conflicts. 
and then the ending, what happens in the ending. So this could be a quick sketch out. These, these can be tricky for kids because they wanna to try to fit so much in there, or they can be perfect. It just really depends on the child and whether they get the concept. And so what you would, if you're gonna have them do something like this, and we even have this exact same thing, here's the, see, see how, how similar this, this curriculum is? This is the, the younger kid one. It's exactly the same. Much of it is exactly the same. So um, if, if you're going to use this, use it with an example story so that they can see. Do you, do you know what I'm saying? That you wanna back up to what the beginning looked like. Oh, okay, and then they're like, and then you can say, and then this quick sketch, the, this, is the, this is the problem and this is how it was developed, but we're not writing everything on this. This is just a quick framing it out, uh, the planning it, okay. And then developing the characters. So this, is, this would be like a whole separate mini lesson where you're, they're starting to really think about their characters. And so um, you can have them kind of come up with ideas. I would probably do this with them. And I might even try to get them to try to stick with within three, maybe three characters would be a really probably doable amount for a kid. When you start to get into more characters, it does start to get a little bit trickier for them to try to manage all of that. Um, developing the characters in the narrative um, at the beginning of the story and then problems, events in the story that influence them and then how did they maybe change by the end of the story if we want them to have a change. Um, I pulled this in from the Read, Write, Think website. That also is a website that has some good resources in there. Um, conflict type chart. So you can see that there's only four of the conflicts. They don't have the destiny one even on here. So you could use this when you're doing a mini lesson about conflicts and you could be going through uh, any story and you could pick out conflicts and you could say, oh, we found a character versus character conflict, let's write it down. Oh, we found a character versus self conflict, let's write it down, you know what I'm saying? And you, you could use that as like kind of breaking it down as you're reading through any story. Um, and then uh, I would probably use this one from the Read, Write, Think for helping them think through a conflict that they're gonna put in their story. So what is the conflict that you want to pull in and why does it occur and what are some ways that it could be resolved? Because each of the conflicts will get resolved in the story. Or you could only use this one for the climax, the high point of the story and really have them develop that one. Okay, now, so I just kind of peppered in a couple of things, but now we're, we're right back to step up. Okay, so here we come to dialogue, and I love how they show the examples of the importance of um, showing versus telling in writings, because that's a tricky thing for a lot of students. How, they're telling a story makes sense to them, but how do we adjust our language so that the person reading our book is super engaged in it? Well, we have to flip over to the showing side. And so talking through the differences here is really good. And one thing that I would do actually, I would wait until we had a rough draft written and then I would pull this mini lesson in. I might pull it in at the beginning so that they're thinking about it, but I would definitely pull it right back in again during a revision. And that's all we would do. We would just go through their rough draft together on the template or whether it's written out full on a piece of paper. And we'd say, okay, I would probably pick out a few areas that I feel like they, we probably could develop together and flip from telling to showing. And I would have this as an example and I would use this. Okay, now, this is, an, this is wonderful right here. How do we start? Well, this curriculum gives us very specific ways. Start with the where, and then they give you an example from actual literature. Or you could choose start with the when, and then here's an example of that. Or start with an action verb, and here's what that would look like. So, you know, start with an interesting comment or dialogue, and that's what it looked like. This, this would be like the very first thing that you write in your story. So before they even start writing their story, you wanna have a mini lesson on how do we start a narrative, a story, then we, how do we hook our reader in right away? And we would go through that. Again, this is totally appropriate for younger kids. You could come up with something, if you felt like any of this was too advanced for your child, you could come up with something similar that's a little bit younger. Okay, um, here's more examples. 
So we've got, and we've got those examples and we've got these examples. So two pages of examples. More. Oh, no, this one's different. Okay, excuse me. These are all totally, these are all a variety with two pages of just really good examples. And then here, I love this one. It's the exact same story starting at six different ways. This one is great. After you go through all the like six different, like the six different ways to potentially start a story. And then you say, okay, so here we have a story about this girl, Maya. And <clears throat> I'm starting to lose my voice. And she has to make a cake. That's the gist of the story, okay? So let's see, if we were to start this story with a where, here's what it could look like. If we were to start the same story with a when, here's what it could look like. Are you guys following? <clears throat> okay, and the kids are gonna really like that because that starts them thinking, oh, okay, I already know what my story, what, my, what I want my story to be about, but now I have a plan. I, ha I think I might want it to be, I wanna start it with dialogue. I want my characters talking to each other right off the bat. Okay, great, well, let's do it. Look at there's quotation marks, they're talking. Okay, there's gonna need to be a special mini lesson about how to punctuate dialogue, by the way, we'll get there. Okay, and then look, we've got an open thing. You can say, okay, you know what? We just did our mini lesson. I want you to go spend the next 10 minutes and I want you to pick two of these and come up with two, two starters for your story. Don't ever ask a child to do all six. That's, it, they won't do it. And they won't like, they won't wanna do it and they'll shut down on you. Give, but ask them to do two. And then you say, which one do you like the best? And right then, boom, that's the one, circle it. That's the very first thing you're gonna write in your story. Let's get it down on the template, like make it official, right? Because that's exciting. You're, now you're, the train's on the track and it's moving. Okay. Um, okay, now this is another good one. So now we've got the train on the track. Now what do we do? Okay. So all we have is a few sentences, but we want to get the beginning developed. So first, use one of the six ways to begin your story. Here's an example. Here's a different example. Then after that, imagine where the action is headed. Here's the same example, imagining where the action is headed. Here's this example two, same thing. We've just added to it, right? The third thing, add more sentences to keep the reader interested and move the story along. Here's this first example with more sentences added. And then here's the second example with more sentences added. And then you say, okay, go sit down, go spend 15 minutes, add more sentences to your beginning. Come show me when you're done, bye. Right, you just, <laughs> you, just you give them a path and you send them to do it and then they come back. Okay, writing dialogue, this needs to be done. Um, uh, it, it would be when you teach them um, the correct punctuation for dialogue, have this be the only thing you're doing for writing that day. And if you can pull in IXL or if you can pull in worksheets from any grammar that you might have with your curriculum, you're gonna wanna have some dialogue practice ready to go, okay? Trust me, it will be in IXL. Um, <clears throat> so this gives you the rules for punctuating dialogue with really good examples. When I teach writing dialogue to students, no matter what age they are, I color code it. Absolutely, you want colored pencils, okay? So I'd probably print off a couple of pages of this so that you have one and they have one and you have different colors. And like, for example, um, where is the dog? Asked Jacob. And I'd say, okay, who's talking here? Jacob is, how do you know? Well, it says, ask Jacob. Oh, okay, so if it just said, where is the dog? Would you know who's talking? Nope, so the ask Jacob is important, right? Yep, right there, you've just planted a seed. How do we know Jacob is talking? Because it says, ask Jacob. Nope, there's another reason that you knew Jacob was talking. Oh, those like, yeah, that's right. The quotation marks. The quotation marks tell, they indicate that a character in a story is talking. They let us know when they start talking and they let us know when they end talk, they stop talking. Now, you would be amazed. So I don't know if you guys know this or not, but when I stopped, teaching middle school and then I started tutoring. So then when I was tutoring, I was working with kids one-on-one -on -one in my house, right? For like 14 years. And so tons and tons of teaching writing to kids. I, you would not believe I could have like high schoolers in here and they would like no problem be able to read a book 
like right there next to me. We, I'd op I, I loved to open up to novels that they were into and use those as our examples. I'd like stick them on the coffee machine and I wouldn't use things like this. I'd use something that they were reading for school um, and because to make it more real life for them. And I'd say, well, tell me where somebody is done talking. And they'd always be able to tell me. But then I'd say, well, okay, you know they're done, but how do you know they're done talking? I don't know. Hmm. So that it has to be sometimes explicitly taught. And a lot of times when it's explicitly taught um, is when they're younger and they're maybe not quite ready to take all that knowledge in. And it may not be explicitly taught from that point forward. It's just expected that they own it and they don't. So, ex so, so the reason I'm sharing this with you is that if, if you're gonna be doing this with an older child, a high school, middle schooler or a high schooler, please don't assume that they know how to punctuate their dialogue. They probably don't. And that's not because you failed or their teachers have failed them. It's a tricky concept and it needs to be explicitly taught. And they also should have this in a plastic sleeve at the ready when they're working on their story so that they can constantly pull it out and look at it, okay? Otherwise, your life's gonna be miserable going through and trying to revise the punctuation for the dialogue at the end. <laughs> So, so hit this one heavy and maybe even hit it heavy and then a few days later pull it in again. But this is something that it's, it's, it's tricky. Again, using actual stories is really helpful. So when I say hit it heavy and then pull it in again, when you pull it in again, pull it in with a book that they're reading. Literally just take, just take a copy on the copy machine if you can, use colored pencils and just identify things as you go. Someone new is talking. How do you know? Well, because I know that's what's happening in the story. This person wouldn't say that. No, you know, because it's a new paragraph and it's indented. Huh, look at that. Your brain knew. You just knew because you've been reading books since you started reading. But you're a teenager now and you just did, you didn't know that you knew that, but you did know that. So now that I've just identified that for you, that you know when a, when a character is done talking, that you have to go to another paragraph and indent for the next character to start talking, you have to do that in your writing too, right? And so that, that's something that we, we pull in and I'm gonna go back up to the uh, example. Even if they're not writing a story, look, look at this example. See everywhere we have indentations. It's because a new person is getting ready to talk or the scene is changing, right? So nobody's talking right here. It was then that Julio noticed something small and brown. So the situation changed. So that needs to have a new indentation as well. So this, this can be explicitly taught and then pulled in with, with real life examples. Just grab any books around the house. You'll be able to find it. Um, okay. Uh, it's possible that I accidentally double copied that in there. So we'll skip that. Oh, oh no, 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 I just didn't get to that point. Writing dialogue, okay, dialogue. Okay, so talking about transitions. So earlier in the, this thing, we had the list of transitions. So this gives you a good breakdown of that. I won't go into depth on here, but this is, this is very important to read through. Um, and then here we have a really great list of narrative transitions. You know what? This should be something else that you have in a plastic sleeve that they have right there for them as they're writing so that they don't have to try to remember how to shift from one idea to another. They can just look for, well, what would make sense? Let me just pick one right off this list. You know, if they don't have to use their own creativity, they can find one on here. That's okay, they should, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Okay, and Lori, we're at, yeah. Can you talk to us a little bit more about the colored pencils and how you would use those with dialogue? Yeah, um, let me think. I have the paper, so give me one second to get to that page. I have it. Starting a narrative. Okay. Okay, so I don't, my colored pencils are out at the dining table. So I'm gonna stop share real quick so you guys can see me. Can you guys see me big now? Okay, 
All right, so what I would probably do, um, probably start with two colors at first. So I'm gonna start with pink and blue. And I'm gonna say, okay, where, if, the, if a person is talking, we're gonna underline it in blue, okay? So we're gonna start with the first one. So right here, where is the dog, asked Jacob. Oh, where is the dog? Jacob is talking. So I'm gonna underline that. Notice, and then I'm gonna point something out to him. I'm gonna say, it's a question, where is the dog? Like I would say it in the questioning terms, where is the dog? And then we also know, we know it's a question because it starts with a question word. It ends with a question mark and asked Jacob. So I've just kind of be really explicit about that. And then I would say, okay, how do we know that he's done talking? Well, okay, so we know he started talking here. That quote, can you guys see my close enough? Okay, so he started talking here and he stopped talking here because that's where the quotation marks end. And then I would point out a couple of other things that where we start the quotation marks, they're going towards the words, okay? And the closing quotation marks are coming the opposite direction. They're, and then I, do, I like to do this. I say, okay, <clears throat> get your fingers going, put up our, your fingers. And I'm gonna tell you right now, Katrina, I've done this at least with one of your kids. <laughs> <laughs> these are our quotation marks and we're going to hug the punctuation. So get your fingers going. Let's go quotation marks. And they hug the punctuation. I make them do it several times because that's that tactile and it sticks in their brain because this is something that, that a lot of, even a lot of adults aren't quite sure about. Where do I put my punctuation with quotation marks? So it's tricky, right? It's tricky. And, it, and one of the reasons why adults even get confused is that when we're writing formal writing and we're pulling in textual support, it's punctuated slightly differently. So with dialogue, this is why this helps kids remember. The, the quotation marks hug the punctuation. It's somebody talking. It's more of a personal kind of a thing. And so I always, always point out, excuse me, I use a different color. So three colors, okay, three colors. I'm gonna pull it right up. So I say, okay, here, the punctuation in this case is a question mark. So I'm gonna circle the question mark and I wanna point out to you that the, the quotation marks are hugging the punctuation, which is the question mark, okay? And it's very, very helpful to have one of these little helper words. Where is the dog? Asked Jacob. So we wanna to try to pull these in as much as we can. Okay, now, we're gonna take the same and we stick with the exact same colors. So if we started with pink to identify the quotation marks, we stick with pink. If we did blue to identify when someone's talking, we stick with blue, right? And then if we have a special word that helped us understand how the dialogue came out, right? It, so it helps us understand if, is the person angry? Is the person excited? Is the person sad? A lot of times we find out about that based on that special word right after the dialogue. So then that's why I would do like a squiggle, like that's a special word, okay. Um, and then I would just kind of keep, I would go through it like that. I would do that exact same thing. Now, let me find the example narrative here. Okay, so let's pretend like, okay, so, First thing I would do would be this paper, okay? And then we'd have this out in front of us. And let's pretend like um, this got copied out of a text, or not a textbook, sorry, a novel, or a book, a book that, my, that that child was was reading. All right, so I would say, we're gonna add another layer to this now, okay? So we've just talked about where the quotation marks go and these special helper words that help us get a sense of the mood of what's going on in the dialogue. But now we have to add the other layer of, when do we indent? And we know in expository writing that we indent when a paragraph is done. So we indent when we're going to a whole new main idea and we start a new paragraph, right? That's essay format. That's how our textbooks are set up, right? Well, that is not at all how narrative writing is set up. Narrative writing, we indent for very different reasons. One of the reasons we indent, and we'll pick it out together. Well, first of all, we always, how you gotta take these off, we always, start with indenting because it's the first paragraph. We must start with that. And so we're going to put an arrow right there. Am I using the same? I should be using a different color. Sorry. 
So that's an indentation. And then I'd say, why is that being indented? Oh, it's the start. I would have them, I would do it on my paper. They'd have their, a copy of their paper in front of them. We're doing the same thing at the same time. I'm not doing it and they're watching. I'm doing it and they're doing it, right? Okay. Um, so, so we're gonna put an arrow and we're gonna say why, okay. Um, so then we're gonna read this, but Elliot glanced over at Julio and Sam, race you, he said with a smirk and took off down the street. Wait a minute, it's indented right here. Why is it indented right there? Well, let's read on and see if we can find out. Julio looked at Sam. Oh, here's why someone else is getting ready to talk. If Elliot, who said race you with a smirk, right? We know the tone now, they're having fun. If Elliot had said race you, who, sorry. If Elliot had continued talking, we would not have a new paragraph here. It would have continued on because it was still Elliot. The story continued on, but it was still Elliot who was talking. So I just kind of focus on that. And if as I'm going, I've lost that student, their eyes are glazing over, or they're just like, yeah, like I, I'm picking, the whole time I'm doing this, I'm picking up on their body language. And if I've lost them, I'm done. I stop it right there and I say, okay, we're gonna pick up here tomorrow. And I just don't even push it from that point because I want them super fresh with me. And I've got, if I've gotten them through this, and I've started this, that's really good, even if I only get to this. But we definitely wanna take it directly into here. Have I, is that helpful, Katrina? But that, okay, cool. Um, and, and then again, depending on the child and whether they're picking up on it very quickly or not, I might even go ahead and take this same, so here I'm just really focusing on indenting and then saying why, but I might need to go ahead and underline when somebody's talking too. And I might need to circle the quotation marks and circle the punctuation too, depending on whether they've picked up on it or not. Okay. Um, now, if we're talking about working with little kids and teaching them this, I would not ask little kids to punctuate dialogue correctly. They're not going to be able to do it. So you're going to know it'll be very obvious to you from their writing when a character is talking. So you'll put the, the punctuation in and you'll tell them, I'm using quotation marks with an exclamation mark because your character is talking and they're very excited. Or I'm using quotation marks with a question mark because your character is asking a question. Does that make sense? So we're not expecting, like there's no way you could get through this lesson with a little kid. This is probably middle school and up. Um, I'm you know, sixth grade and up. Fifth grade, maybe, depending on their ability to, to learn something like that. Um, and you might just, it might just be a matter of um, picking it out of one of their books and then breaking it up into little smaller chunked lessons to help them. They will eventually get this, but it's, it is a little, it's kind of complex, to be honest with you, right? So um, I don't, I don't make a big deal out of it, but I definitely identify it. And if they're ready, if I feel like a student is ready to really learn that, that's how I pull it in. And I always pull it in with step up because it's just really well done. So like I've, I've just over the years, I've used several different curriculums, two in particular that are my favorite, but step up for narrative. It doesn't get better than this. This is the best that I've seen. Okay. I, let me see here. Let me go back to this really quick because we are almost done. I think we're at the ending. Okay, so, so you know how we had um, ways to begin a narrative and then a bunch of examples? They, we end this with ways to end a narrative. So helping the child wrap it up. How could they end it? They could note a feeling and here's an example of what that might look like. They could remember a character. Here's an example of what that might look like. So, and they give you two pages of examples of that, which is really nice. So you would explicitly you'd read through that with them and you talk about um, how do you want yours to end? Here we go again, pick two and go write your ending and then come back and show me. Go take 10 minutes. You know, you give them a specific minute time, 10 to 15 minutes to think about two different alternative endings um, and then they're done. Okay. so. This would be, I probably should have put this up above that, but excuse me, here we have, um, here we have uh, some example narratives. Here would be how it started, here's how it ended. So, 
So this is from an actual narrative. Here's the author. This is Thank You Ma'am, Langston Hughes, whose two short stories, how they exactly started, how they exactly ended. So these are really good examples to show them. Um, and then here we just have steps, steps of how do we, how do we get this draft going? If they haven't, but to be, so this is also another one you'd probably want to pull out and put closer to the top um, because when you get to ways to end your narrative, your child's probably already mostly written most of their story, right? So I should have put this up higher. Sorry about that. But this, this gives you and them reminders of important things. Make sure the sentences are varied in length. Make sure you're using action verbs. Stories have lots of paragraphs, short ones, long ones. Start a new paragraph when the action changes. Use narrative transitions. You know what you could use this as actually? This would be a really great list for revision. This would be perfect to use for your revision. So you could say, okay, we gotta make sure that we have very, a variety of sentence structures. So let's go through and find some we can either make longer more complex or that we can make shorter and you know mix and match things up. Oh, we have some action verbs, but let's find some, some better ones we can trade out with. Does that make sense, you guys? So use this as a guide for revision. This would be a perfect revision guide. And then uh, we have an example, revision little lesson there. And the same thing I just showed you, but said slightly differently. And the very last thing I have in here are some prompts. And I, I specifically put this up at the last because I think that you're not even gonna need this, really. Because there's already some, I don't know. I feel like if you go through the list that I gave you closer to the beginning, there's some really creative ideas in there that are gonna be more fun for your kids to do than these. But if, if, if you're really stumped and they really can't come up with an idea, here you go. Here's some prompts. <laughs> And on that note, I, any questions? I am all done. I'm gonna stop share. All done with all my talking. Well, I have just a small question. So yeah. it's kind of more of a recap. So it seems like you're telling us that in the very beginning, when we decide we wanna teach narrative writing to our kids, the first thing we're gonna do is get out some books and read with them and point out illustrations and dialogue, point of view. Um, let's see what else I took notes here. Um, types of conflict. We're just going to be pointing that out as we read. And then yeah. the next thing we're going to do is we're going to move into brainstorming ideas for them to write their own and work through that step up to writing curriculum, which is the packet. And then, then we're going to start working on specific things like dialogue or like paragraphs. And yes. then at the very, very, very end, then we're going to revise and publish. So did I get it right? Did I miss anything? No, you that you got it. You nailed it. Um, so let's talk about time frame here. Um, I'm going to tell you right now that the process of this is probably a month or five weeks to get to this point. And when I did this with Cole, I had two other little girls that we were in a little a little class. They came to our house and they also uh, wrote books. So I took the three of them. It was probably it was probably we didn't do it every day. Um, they were little like 10. Um, but so I think we met, I'm trying to remember, I think we met twice a week and that probably took about five, maybe six weeks to get to the published draft stage. When you're, you know, you, when it's you with your child, I probably wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do it five. I would not work on this five days a week. I'd probably work on it three to four days a week um, and 30 minutes at a time, 45 if they're older. Um, but I think 30 minutes is a good amount of time and plan on this taking time. This isn't something you want to rush. When it's done, you're going to have a treasure. This is a treasure. This is like my heart. Like this is just so special. Um, when I when I go when I flip through and I I look at these, I remember I remember every single moment and the excitement <clears throat> that my son had. Sorry, I'm losing my voice. The excitement that my son had when he was talking about what he was going to do for the background because he had this image in his mind and it had to look like fire. And mom, how do I make it look like fire? And so we had to talk about, well, there'd be like a mix of red and orange. Okay, I need red and orange paint then, okay, I need that. Okay, we're gonna get red and orange paint. You know, like, like the conversations that we had and then him digging through his Lego tubs to get exactly the right pieces that he had to have. I mean, it was just, <laughs> it's just so stinking cute, you know? And it, like, I'll never forget that, that time. 
Um, and the, so, so he had already written his whole story before we did the scenes, right? The story was broken out. I did not have the template. I wish I had been smart enough to think about that when I did this with my son, but I didn't have that. Um, I had all the other pieces just kind of in my head, but a template would have made all the difference for us. Um, <clears throat> so what I had them do is they wrote their story out on paper and then we did the cutting, like basically where does it make sense that the scene would change or that, that, that your, the action changes, um, where do you want to break it up? And that's how we did it. Of course, we did it based on the number of pages that we had as well, but um, what was I wanting to say? Okay, so the words happened first and then we had so much fun with the illustrations. I, I wrote on this one paper that has all these notes in here to you, but I didn't, dis I didn't say, but I wanna just make one point of this. Don't, I, I wanna caution you to not let your child do their art, direct their illustrations directly in the book because everybody makes mistakes and they're gonna want this to be really nice, right? They're gonna be excited, they're gonna work hard and when they get to the point where they're doing their illustrations, they know exactly what they want to have happen. And if they draw something and they, and they can't erase it, you know, when you can't get that erase line out of there and then they're gonna get super frustrated and upset. And I don't know, you know, everybody's kid reacts to that differently, but I, some kids just shut down and they just don't wanna do anymore. Some kids get angry, some kids feel like a failure. So avoid that. And I recommend you avoid that 100% by doing the illustrations on separate paper just like you're going to glue stick the typed text in, glue stick the illustration in. That 100% recommend that. What you know, and, and as I told you, these were actual photographs, um, so that was easy enough. You know, we had to glue stick them in, but you know, a lot of you are going to have kids who are going to want to do paintings, or they're going to want to draw their illustrations. Give get them some get them some heavier paper. You don't want it to be on copy paper. You want it to be a little bit thicker, a little bit quality. Um, actually, let me see the thickness of this. No, it could be copy paper because this is, this is quality paper, this is thick. So it could be copy paper, could be fine. Um, and you just wanna make sure that it's cut to fit exactly, but a little bit smaller. Because if it's exactly and you try to close it, it's gonna gum up, right? So just a smidgen smaller than exact. Any, any other questions? I have a question. Um, so tuning in this evening, I wasn't sure what I was going in for. I, I saw the email last minute and I just didn't know what I was going in with, um, which this is great. This is, um, I have a 14 year old um, who does book shark language arts. So she's already writing a lot. Um, so when I look at something like this, that like, really breaks it down. Um, I love all the examples and the, the transition things. And I mean, there's lots in here that, that we can work with. But when, when you're talking about someone who is al almost like an independent learner, um, do I just present this as a project? Because I don't see us sitting down and going through the little, like, sh honestly, to be like, seriously, mom? Oh, yeah, I know. You know what I mean? So, but I want her to learn those basics. So is she, for the project, creating a children's book from something that she creates with her own um, advanced level of writing or whatever? You know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, I would do it anyway. I would just okay. say, you know what, I really want to have this special time together. Let, let's just kind of set aside 30 to 45 minutes, three or four days a week. That's just our time. And, you know, just, you know, do it on, snuggle on the couch or ha have a special snack or tea party or something that's like your special time so that, you, so that, you know, she's, she's not feeling like, like I, like I picked up from you that she's like, mom, I, I got this. I'm independent. Right. Mm -hmm. If you, if you want your independent teenager to be willing to learn these nitpicky things, which they do need to have explicitly taught, um, you have to have buy-in. So, so I would preface it with, 
um, I would preface it with that this is going to be our special time. And I want you to know that high school teachers use children's storybooks all the time to teach concepts, to teach character development, to teach dialogue, to, to you know, it's, it's not common necessarily for a high school English teacher to have a child or a teenager create a book like this. But if it was an elective class, yeah, they would be doing that. Um, an elective that was geared towards storytelling or children's stories or something like that, or short stories, they probably would, but they pull in children's books because there can be beautiful representations and give a, you know, in a quick, quick minute, you know, just a couple of minutes. So, and, you know, teenagers still love kids books, especially if you pull some really high quality ones that are super creative. Um, and I think with, with your daughter, especially if you're kind of worried about her maybe tuning out to this. Um, I think I would show her that list, um, the, pa the paper that, this one where it says ideas for writing a story. Yeah. And I would go to those um, web, that website I showed you that has like the flipped stories and things like that. Um, and maybe, um, you know what else you could do? You could, you know how when you go to Amazon and you search a title of a book and it lets you look inside the book and you can look at a few pages I'd probably pick a few titles and do that through Amazon um, and see which ones she thinks are, are maybe, or that you think are gonna be interesting and then get your hands on those books and use those when you're going through and you're talking about um, what that would look like. So if you're gonna do a story, uh, a fairy tale from the perspective of a different character, definitely pull in some examples of that. If you're gonna do mythology and you're gonna have her pick a myth and write her own version of it or a fairy tale and, and, and not her own version, but an expanded version, right? Because myths and fairy tales are very short. Um, get several copies of the same thing and point out how different every one of them can be. None of them are gonna be the same because they're all written by different people. And so you're a teenager, you absolutely have the ability to take this story and make it your own too. Right. Right. Um, if, if that's kind of where your thinking would go with, she would want to do, she might want to do something totally different, but. Well, yeah. there are so many prompts in that, in, you know, where you talk about flipping or um, showing the crayon writing or different. I was just excited and I thought, because she's a voracious reader as well. Yeah. And so I know her mind will go around to that too. So um, that's, yeah, it seems really cool. I think she's really going to like it. Okay. Except for, you know, how involved mom is. <laughs> well, and I was going to suggest something. I, I have a wide range of kids myself from high school all the way down to elementary school. And something that we did this year is we got a bunch of different Cinderella myths and, um, well, not myths, but fairy tales from all around the world. And we read, you know, tons of different Cinderella stories. And this would have just been a perfect conclusion to that unit, but I didn't know this yet. So, um, so let me share this with you guys. If we had read all those different Cinderella stories from around the world, and then I could have said, listen, I want you to pick any country, any civilization, and I want you to write a Cinderella story from that. My kids all from high school all the way down would have been able to do that and would have gotten excited about that. So um, I'm just throwing that out there because I wish I would have known this back in the fall. Well, do you think they would remember? Could you just pull a few in to kind of remind them and get them excited again and, and do this? Well, now I'm thinking about the myths. So that's what um, I want to move into. But I just, I'm thinking how you can do this with a large age range of kids from high school all the way down. And also I just wanted to mention there is a high school, um, well, Lori knows more about this than I do, but it's a children's literature class that's taught in high schools. And so you could do something like this and get credit for it in high school Mm -hmm. easily mm -hmm. well it, but you'd have to have enough going on that it would be at or close to 90 hours to make it but you could you absolutely could I mean you could sit down and have some fun if any if anybody's on this right now and is kind of thinking in along this line or you're gonna watch this later and you're thinking I think I might want to do this with my high schooler I'm happy to help you plan out you know what I mean I'm happy to just sit there and just kind of like brainstorm with you and come up with you know, what, how could you take this and really build it out over an entire semester very easily? And it could be really cool. So yeah, that's a really good idea, Katrina. 
uh, yep, a, a high school um, English elective. Absolutely. Yep. Their senior year, is it one semester that they do an English elective or is it both semesters senior year is going to be English elective? I'm trying to remember. It's both. Both. But, okay. but kids always need electives. I mean, yeah. even if you've done all your English classes, you can always use an extra elective, especially for something fun like this. Yes, absolutely. Yep. And it might even be something fun to do over the summer and then put on the fall transcript too. Yeah. Yeah, this has been fun. You guys, I appreciate you being here. Thank you. It's really encouraging to me to look, be looking at the screen and see smiling faces and nodding as you're getting in. And I, I appreciate that. Thank you. It's hard. It's, it's hard to be talking and worried that I'm missing stuff or I'm talking too fast or boring you guys or something. So I appreciate you guys have been a fantastic audience and I, I really thank you. Very this was far from boring, Lori. This was amazing. <laughs> amazing. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're absolutely welcome. Yeah. Well, and don't forget there, um, I'll have the printouts of the documents that Lori shared with us. They'll be at the office. And then those books will also be at the office. So um, just stop by anytime. Michaela has a basket of them. And if this becomes a really popular thing and we run out, I, think or 60 of them. I can't remember exactly how many. I don't know, actually, now I'm trying to think. I don't think I stuck 60 in that thing. Um, I'm sure that our principal will be happy to buy more if we start to run out. So if you get there and you're like, oh, you know, I guess what I'm saying is if you get, okay, let me back up. If you get there and there's no more books because it, this has been something that a lot of people want to do, please let me know like immediately. And actually I'll ask Michaela to let me know if we start to run low and, and I'll ask our principal if we can buy some more. Um, and they, they, they came pretty fast this last time. So we can get them really quickly. We'll have it definitely before you're, you need it. You know what I mean? Cause it's the final draft part. So yeah, we'll get, we'll get them right. Katrina, we can probably promise that we'll get them at least for this school year. <laughs> yeah. Call Lori. <laughs> well, thank you again for joining us tonight. And Lori, thank you for sharing all your knowledge and wisdom with us. You are just a treasure trove of wisdom. So thank you all. All right.